Hey, my name is Amanda. I want to thank you for joining us today. We hope that this message inspires you, builds your faith, and helps you find your next step toward Jesus. Enjoy the message. Our scripture this morning comes out of Genesis 15, it's verses 2 through 6. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall be your offspring. Abram believed the Lord and credited it to him as righteousness. This is the word of our Lord for his people. Good to see everybody. Um, so earlier this year in June, I think it was June 22nd, something pretty tragic happened to me. I turned 40, and um, which always on the earlier side of 40 felt like it was going to be, you know, I was going to be ancient when I when I got there. And uh, and I, I know for some of you, you're you know, you would immediately think that's not old. I know, I know, I know. Uh, but I've noticed that my life has started to change. I, in some ways, I feel old. Like at 4:30, I'm like, dinner sounds nice, you know, <laughs> and um, going to bed early sounds good. I can hurt myself sleeping. I'm not sure how that happened. Um, you know, all those kinds of things. And but one of one of the um, realizations that kind of comes with that. Maybe this is tied to you know how people have talked about like midlife crises and that kind of thing. Is that uh, options are really disappearing in my life? You know, there there are things that I wanted to do that I'm never gonna be able to do. Um, there are things that I hoped to have that I'll, I'll never be able to have. Um, I, I have had to say goodbye to my dream of being a supermodel. I've had to say goodbye. <laughs> to my dream of being drafted into Metallica, I've got, you know, like it's all gone. It's all gone. And, um, and those are, those are I'm, I'm being playful, obviously, but um, as we get older, as life moves forward, as we make choices, you know, choosing something is saying no to other things, um, options start to get smaller, but there's some things I want. And I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to have it. Can I, if I could talk to you about one thing that I want is this. Um, this is a 1969 Camaro SS. And I have dreamed of it since like my freshman year of college. And I'm not picky. I can have that one or this one. I don't, the red with the black hockey stripes is great with the 350. That one, the hood's a little too much. But I'll take it. I'll take it. This is a 67. I'm fine with that. I can lower my standards. Um, you know, or, or this one is pretty shiny. Um, but I would, I would just love it. So anybody here that's feeling generous, you know, let me know. Um, and, but I, I just, I have always thought, man, um, some part of my life will feel complete when I am sitting in that car. I'm in some road in Arizona that hasn't had a law enforcement officer in a decade on it. And, and I've got my hand on, on the stick shift ready to go. You know, I mean, like, I, there's something in me that just wants that. Um, but then there's the kind of wants that are more than that. You know, the kind of things that are a little heavy. There's the light things. Like, uh, for a long time, about every Christmas, I watch this Saturday Night Live sketch. It's an old one, like decades old, of Steve Martin talking about what he wants for Christmas. And he starts off by saying, if I had one wish for this, for this Christmas, it would be that all the children of the world would hold hands and sing together and love and joy and peace and harmony. If I had two wishes, it would be that Every month, $10 million would get deposited to me in a Swiss bank account, tax-free. And If I had three wishes, and, it, and, he, and then he starts rearranging his wishes. He's like, no, I want to I sleep with these beautiful women. No, I want to have ultimate power. No, I want my enemies to die like pigs in hell. No, I want my, you know, and he has this whole, and, and he kind of comes back around. He's like, I guess the singing thing's fine. And, um, you know, there's that level of, like, wish, you know, peace and harmony, 
ultimate power. But then there's some things that settle in our soul that are heavy, that aren't just the kind of like selfish thing, but are real like aches and desires, and they produce a kind of suffering, a unique kind of pain that all of us carry at some level. Some of us carry it so much. I, I am amazed. I, you, you are to be revered by how you carry it. Um, some of us carry it lighter. And I, I just want to look at, today we're in a series on how, we, on how we deal with pain in the Christian faith. And I want to take a journey with someone on, um, on kind of the narrative of, of their life around a particular issue. And we're going to be looking at, if you've been around church a while, you're familiar with names like Abraham and Sarah. The beginning of their story, their names are Abram and Sarai, and so I'll probably use those names a little bit interchangeably um, as, we, as we move through this story. But in Genesis 11, Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Ishka. Now Sarai was childless because she was not able to conceive. Now in their day, I mean in our day, that's hard enough. I'm, I'm sh- I know either um, you or someone you love has struggled with infertility. And, um, and again, like for some couples, this is um, hurtful but inconvenient. For some couples, this is, this is major you know, something they, that really is a pain that, that they feel heavy all the time. And in their culture, um, having a child was your identity, especially as a, as a woman and as a father. It was, it was who they were going to pass everything that they owned to. Remember, this is, this is hundreds of years before the idea of an afterlife develops in our scripture. Um, there's no talk of heaven or hell. Um, that's a long way off. This, th- at this point, they are seeing this life as it. And when we leave this life, what, what, is, what are we giving? Who are we giving? Everything that we've done to. What of us will live on? A- and the cultural pressure was enormous. And here are these two people that we have been talked about for thousands of years. When we're introduced to them, it's around something they don't have. It's around a pain that they carry. Now, it's interesting to me that it's in that place that God seems to step forward to them. In Genesis 12, um, I'm going to be skipping a a lot uh, through through this story to go quickly because uh, you don't have seven hours, um, and neither do I, so we'll move somewhat quickly. Genesis 12, God speaking to Abram. He says, I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you. And I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. So God shows up to Abram and he says, let's let's start talking. I am going to make you, this childless person, I'm going to make you into a great nation. So when he meets God, Abram has an interesting encounter. I, I, would, I would argue that God shows up and gives Abram a problem. In, in their first interaction, God gives him a problem. If I could describe why, is all of us have a, um, a, a here. And what, this is our current reality. And God shows up and gives him a there. God comes and talks to him and says, you aren't going to be childless. I am going to make you into a great nation. And when we only have a here, we don't know, maybe we have given up on there being a there. And when there becomes a there, what happens is that creates a tension that is difficult. And when we don't have anything to the right of here, we can kind of just snuggle up and settle into the environment that we're in. Have you ever met a poor soul that grew up in a home where all they ate was frozen yogurt? Do you know what I'm talking about? 
And they, they, didn't, they didn't know that there was ice cream, let alone custard. Right? And the first time that, you know, it sounds a little odd. We're going to put eggs, we're going to put eggs in, in the ice cream thing. Yes, 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 yes. And when you taste it, your first thought's going to be, how many calories are in this? And you're going to say, it doesn't matter, just forget that. And their life is forever rearranged, right? Because they only had a here, and now God shows up and gives them a there. Um, maybe you in, in your life have, have a here, and you've got something in your heart. Maybe it's even something God gave you that produces a there, and that creates a tension, a pain that you live with. Like for Abraham, you know, we could describe his here as childless. Um, if, if you would trust me for this, how would some of you, and I, I, I'm going to need these out loud, how would you describe your here? Maybe it's not you, maybe it's someone you know or love. What would be one word, I'm going to give you a three-syllable limit and, and stick with me on spelling because I might mess it up, but what are some of your here's? Death, yeah. What else? Hmm? Anger, yeah, living with anger. What's that? Poor health. Poor health, yeah. I'm gonna stop there just because it's harder to write below that line. Yeah, childless, death, anger, poor health. We could go to um, unemployment or employment that I don't want. We could go to family problems. We could go to ruptured relationships with my, with my kids. We could uh, go to there's, there's something that I want to do that I'm not going to be able to do. Someone could say that I feel stuck. I feel depressed. I, I feel anxious. I don't have enough money or enough resources to be able to change that. And when there becomes a here, when God starts whispering to Abraham about the possibility, even the promise of a child, that creates tension for him. You know, when, when there's um, the opportunity for life, this is where we want to go. You know, is life possible? Was, was, was death necessary? Um, we can talk about anger. I want to have peace. I want to have peace. And, and one way to deal with it is just to forget that that's an option. Um, poor health. I want to be healthy. You know, in, um, as, I, as I understand it, in... In soccer in England, and um, football, as, as they uh, call it, um, you know, they'll say it's the hope that kills you when you're rooting for a team. Like, if you, if you didn't care, you know, if there, wouldn't be any, there wouldn't be any pain. It's the hope that kills you. And, and, and here we are. God shows up to Abram, who maybe at some level he has accepted his state, and God creates a problem for him because he loves him. And he calls him into difficulty, which is something that God does for us. Um, uh, through the years, there's no child, there's no child, there's no child. And Abram starts to maybe figure out, so what am I going to do about this tension, God, that you've given me in 15.2? And Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, you have given me no children. So a servant in my household will be my heir. Do you hear the hurt there? That like he, he's, I, maybe I was doing a little better before you showed up. And now, now I've got this, this dream that you've given me that isn't playing out. And someone that isn't my kid is going gonna, is gonna to get my legacy the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up to the sky and count the stars if indeed you can count them. And he said to him, so shall your offspring be. In this moment, is this good news or bad news? I wonder. I, does Abraham, re does, he like, does he receive that as peace? Or does he receive that as is like God making him hang on when he would rather let go. 
You know, I don't know. Um, a, a, few, a few chapters later, um, still no child. Still no child. And they take a different approach. Uh, 16.1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. I'm sure they're, they're probably a little over getting referred to as the people who can't receive the thing that they want. But she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. Uh, Hagar, it's an interesting word in Hebrew. The, the H is the, and the gar is immigrant. She, we could literally say that she is the immigrant. And so she said to Abram, Sarah, I said, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. She's got to wonder what the, what the tension was in that conversation. You want me to do what? Actually, in that, in that time, that, that wasn't crazy. You know, there was, there was no medical technology. There was no fertility clinics. There was no doctor to go to. This, that, was, that was culturally accepted as barbaric and abusive as that is. And it launches into this incredibly um, challenging story for chapters about, about Hagar, this woman out of place, um, this woman who ends up bearing uh, Abram a child, and it goes badly between her and, and Sarah, and, and they come to blows. Sarah sends her away, and the Lord finds her weeping in the wilderness and takes care of her and her son, Ishmael. Um, it, it ends up being, even though it's quite terrible, it, it shows that the Lord is quite wonderful. Um, but here's just a couple of strategies of how, of how people can deal with things. You know, on this side um, uh, of things, maybe we could say that Abram, um, he had ignored the pain. He had just like, I- I'm just going to accept that this is my state. And we're, we're just going to deal with it and say, this is how life is. I'm fine. I'm fine, you're fine, what problem, let's move on. It's, it's a little annoying to talk about. Another way of dealing with it is to become bitter. Um, or angry, you can hear it when Abram talks to the Lord, and he's like, you have given me no child. That, that his pain has become something that he has like pulled close to his chest and made a part of who he is. Like, it's become, it's become a part of his identity, which is totally understandable, but he's, he's kind of um, bitter, he's sore, it's, it's become a little dramatic for him, yeah, um, his pain. The, the other way that you could deal with things is, is the approach of, like, let's make this thing happen. God told us we're going to get there. He doesn't seem to be doing his job. Maybe we need to fill in some gaps for the guy, right? So go find the slave, Yeah. And, and maybe one way that, that people deal with things is they make it happen. You know, whether it's God's way or not, God's timing or not, we are going to get there. You know, our, our culture, um, in, in a lot of different ways, uh, promotes this one. That's the, if you can dream it, you can do it. Like, get there. Uh, I, any, I like to watch interviews on YouTube sometimes, especially hot ones. Do anybody else watch hot ones? Yes. yes, where the celebrities eat progressively hotter and hotter hot wings while they answer questions. I don't know why I love that. I think I just like seeing rich people in pain. I don't, it's, 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 this is my sin. I'm sorry, but it's, it's a blast. And, and uh, I know I'm a terrible person. I'm sorry. I'm your pastor. Okay, here we go. And, um, and, but one of the things they'll talk about is like, can you give any advice to any you know, young upcoming actor or musician or sports figure or whatever. And, and the person who has made it out of thousands of people, you know, they'll say, just believe in yourself and try hard and never give up and you'll get there. Here's the problem. They're talking to the one person that like that worked out for. Right? And they're ignoring like the thousands of people that wanted it just as bad and tried just as hard and worked just as much and cried just as many nights and went to as many auditions and it just didn't work out for them. You know, like just working hard is not like the whole equation, right? Right, yeah, I mean, come on. And, and, and here's the thing, but, but what the narrative out there in culture is you can make it happen if you just put in the sweat. You can figure it out. And it's, just, it's, it's sweet. It makes great movies. It's just not true, you know. 
um, it's just not true. And so these are ways that our culture tells us or that we try to deal with the gap because the gap is hard. The gap is hard. But over and over again in the story, God seems to invite them into a different way of holding the tension, of living in the unfulfilled desire, you know, that I have and that you have. Like if we could... If we could rewind to chapter 15, verse 5. He took him outside, which, by the way, the image there is pretty beautiful. It's not that he led him outside. He took him. It's like he, it's like he grabs his hand. This is after Abram kind of lets the Lord have it. He says, let's go outside. Let's go on a walk. He said, look at the sky and count the stars if indeed you can count them. And he said to them, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord. And he credited it to him as righteousness. Being in the gap, not getting what you want, holding the pain, but trusting the God who said he was going to do something about it, even though it has been years and it will be years more. That is what makes Abram righteous before God. This is the verse that Paul comes back to when he says faith has always been what justifies us. It has always been what justifies us. Keeping the law His being awesome has never been what justifies us before God. It's the ability to stand in the pain and to trust that God is good despite what we see. That is what makes us righteous. In, In chapter 18, what's going on is that it has been years more and Abraham and Sarah, now their, their names have changed. They are still waiting on this child, and the drama with Hagar has been full tilt, and it's terrible. And they look out on the horizon, and they see three people approaching them. And we don't really get a good glimpse at who they are, but they are God. Somehow, or they're messengers of God. People, one common interpretation is this is the Trinity. The Trinity is approaching Abraham and Sarah, maybe. And Abram, he, Abraham, he invites them into their house. He asks them to sit down. He, he speaks to them. He feeds them. And in 1810, it says, One of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son next year. Okay, tension is high. Do you think Abraham's blood pressure went down when he heard that or went up? Now Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent, which was behind him, Abraham and Sarah were already very old. They were 70 when they got the promise the first time. This is is decades later. So Sarah laughed. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. Yeah, yeah. I I think at this point she's in her 90s. That's past the age of childbearing. I don't know. So Sarah laughed to herself and, and thought, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, thanks, by the way, and... Now will I have this pleasure? Pleasure? Giving birth in your 90s? Pleasure? I don't know. Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, well, I really have a child now that I am old. Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at this appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son. God keeps showing up and giving Abraham problems, a problem called hope, right? And and I wonder if if there is a different way to carry the tension that God invites his people into. There's a, a bunch of ways we could talk about it. Maybe we could say that we could give it as an offering to God. That the thing that the the Holy Trinity maybe approaches Abraham and sits down at his table, the thing that he sits down at his table around 
is around the tension and the pain. And, and there's this way to carry it. Like if I could, if I could just switch metaphors for a second. If, if this is the pain that we carry, over here, we, we can ignore it. We can carry our disappointment and just stick it in our back pocket and act like it's not there. Sure, our addictions may flare up. Sure, our, our behaviors may go off the rails and, and we try to keep them secret. Sure, we have anger that, that we don't like to admit. Um, maybe, maybe we um, cry ourselves to sleep some nights and we don't know why or when we're washing the dishes. Maybe we, we drop the kids off at school and our heart just kind of sinks sometimes. I don't, know, I don't know what it is. Maybe you're sitting in a nursing home and you're saying it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, and you know it's not fine because we're just carrying it in our back pocket. A- another way to deal with it is, is the bitterness thing, is to like pull it close and like snuggle up to it and say like, this is who I am. I am the person that does not have the thing that I want. This is what defines me. And we're, we're either depressed or anxious, but we're also kind of dramatic about it. And it's sort of on the surface, and it's red hot all the time. Another way is just to say, I will make it happen. This pain, I'm getting rid of it myself. It is going away. I hope that doesn't hit anything expensive. And here's the, here's the thing. Like, <clears throat> I have a backup. Um, that's one way to deal with it is just to say, I'm getting rid of this. I don't care what it takes. I, I'm ditching the pain thing. The tension sucks. I'm out. Chuck it. What God seems to do is invite his people into a space where we hold the pain and we offer it to the Lord as a place to trust him and meet with him. That Christianity, for some people, oddly enough, they see it as a way to eliminate the tension, as a way to eliminate the pain. I don't know what God they're talking about. We're talking about the one that like came and died for us, right? Like the God of the cross, that's ours. And Jesus offers the tension to the Father as an act of worship and intimacy. And I think that the Lord was inviting Abraham and Sarah to hold out their disappointment, their frustration, the tension, the holding it in between, not as something to ignore or to snuggle up to or to get rid of as fast as we can, but as a place to say, God, I want my life to be different. And maybe even you do too, and we might even get there one day. But right now, I want to meet you here. My pain has a seat for you to come sit with me at. And it's open, and it's tender, and it's hard. I, I think that Christianity is quite peculiar. Um, the Apostle Paul, you know, we're talking about the, the Apostle Paul, one of the most revered men in human history, not an overstatement. In 2 Corinthians, he says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, some tension, some suffering that he's carrying. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Dang it. I thought God was here to take away our weakness. But he says, your weakness is something that I'm going to meet you in. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. This is, this is why, that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in my weakness and insults, hardships, persecutions, and difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. One of my favorite authors um, in the spiritual life is a guy named Henry Nouwen, who, among other things, um, chose a single life. Um, and experienced a lot of loneliness around that. That was his, his tension. And um, I, I've read a lot of his books, not all of them. He, dude wrote a lot of books. Um, and just a little bit out of a few chapters in The Inner Voice of Love, which was his journal, it says, your heart only wants one thing, to be with the person who was once able to dispel these frightful emotions but it was in the absence itself, the emptiness within you, that you have to be willing to experience. 
not the one who could temporarily take it away. It is not easy to stay with your loneliness, but to make your pain available to God. He said it is important that you dare to stay with your pain and allow it to be there. You have to own your loneliness and trust that it will not always be there. This next chapter, he says, where you are most human, most yourself weakest, there Jesus lives. Bringing your fearful self home is bringing Jesus home. That when we make space for the fear and the tension and the difficulty, that that is a table that Jesus comes to meet us at. That, you know, people often wonder and question, is the most common question about the Christian faith, how, how can we believe in God when they're suffering? I, got, I find the more I dig into it and the more I look at Jesus, the more I wouldn't approach suffering any other way than a God who wants to meet me in it. He is better than getting what I want because he is what my soul needs. And and sometimes we get what we want. Sometimes God gets us there and we want to celebrate. We want to rejoice. We want to throw a party and get real excited when we get there. There is not bad. We're all going there one way or another when God makes the world right for forever. And in in, uh, Genesis 21, now the Lord was gracious to Sarah As he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age. At that very at the very time God had promised, Abraham gave him the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. And when Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded. Abraham was a hundred years old when Isaac was born to him. You have this image of this 100-year-old man. More vitality than I'm going to have when I'm 100, I'll tell you that. Teaching this kid to walk and talk and holding him by the hands. I mean, the there took a long time. Sometimes we don't get there in this lifetime. And so Abraham carried that for days decades, and we look to him as the model for our faith. Why? Because he was able to stand in the tension and hold it and give it as an offering to God. Honest about the pain, but not needing to make anything happen. Well, sometimes he did. It didn't go well. But when he was trusting the Lord, that was a table that God sat with him at. We'll end with this in Hebrews 11. The author is just super excited about some of the heroes of faith, and right here he's talking about Abraham and Sarah. And he says, all of these people were still living by faith. That's what we call holding the tension is faith. All of these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. We are not expecting satisfaction here in this life. I'll take it when God wants to give it to me, but walking around expecting this world to satisfy us, we are barking up the wrong tree. We were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Here's a verse that haunts me a little bit. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So when I expect the world to satisfy me, that doesn't make God proud of me. That doesn't make God proud of me. But it does something to his heart when his kids trust him that he will be with them in the difficulty and carry it like he carried his own cross 
and will make the world right for forever when we get there. And people that can carry that, God is not ashamed to be called their God because they look like Jesus. They look like Jesus. Would you pray with me? Lord, that, um, that is a, an, an, a bit of an intimidating word. Um, and God, I, I just I want to pray for the people here that are carrying things that are so heavy and they've been carrying them for so long. And God, I pray that they would meet you in that, that they would have an intimacy with you that the rest of us would envy. And that they would have a bright sadness or a heavy joy about meeting with you. Is, is this what you mean when, when you say, take up your cross and follow me? Jesus, we want to be with you and we want to get to the resurrection. We want to get there. We want there. You do too. You promise it. You're making it. But God, in between, help us to be people of faith. Not a faith that pulls us out of our difficulty, but a faith that lets us meet you in it. And in that, we can be a gift to the world. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. If you enjoyed today's message, make sure to subscribe to this channel. Feel free to share this with others that God has put on your heart. To learn more about LaCroix Church or to find your next steps, head to lacroixchurch.org. Thanks again for checking us out, and we hope to see you soon.